Sizwe Mpofu Walsh. I know we were supposed to have coffee um, yesterday, I think, uh, but we never got it. No, not yesterday, the day before yesterday. Mm. But we didn't get a chance. Um, so I guess this is going to be our coffee and mm. our official first chat. I'm hoping we'll chat more because the more I engage your content, mm. you know, a lot of people say how intelligent you are and how knowledgeable you are. And I'm one of those people who's like, ah, whatever, man. Mm. But I actually realized it's, it's, it's grounded in a lot of truth. And I'm fascinated by your mind, your story, and I'm hoping we'll discuss some of it today. But I'm, I'm hoping that you will come back more and more and we can chat about it. I think just to kick off, your mom, mm. I believe, is, is everything to you. And if you don't mind, I'd like you to please tell us about your mother. Mm. Firstly, it's great to be here. Um, sorry we didn't get to have our coffee, but... Um, Big ups to you and team for what you're doing. <laughs> sure. Um, wow, the numbers are crazy. Some of us have been slugging away for three years here. And why, why do you like numbers? I think it. I've actually realized on yeah. various platforms you yeah. mentioned the numbers. I watch closely because there's a lot that goes into this YouTube production yeah. thing. You know, people see a finished product, but there's a lot of premeditation and work. So anytime I see someone doing something and it catches, yeah. I know that they've been thinking deeply and, and working hard. Are you, um, are you chasing numbers on your platform? You know, to some extent, yes, but to some extent, no. Um, I know how to get numbers. Yeah. I think we all figure out the formula. Yeah. But there are certain things that I also wouldn't necessarily do to chase the numbers. So I want numbers, but I'm not gonna do anything to, to get numbers and sure. so there's a bit of a balance there like twerk on screen and <laughs> listen to, like review my piano tracks yeah, exactly yeah wait till the end of this interview boom <laughs> jeez um so big ups to you and the team thank you real um, recognize real so we really appreciate it indeed yeah. indeed no recognize you um yeah you know i'm often seen through the prism of my father mm. for those who don't know by now who've been living under a rock advocate Dalim bofu Utalim Bofu is your dad. Yeah, can you believe it? Jeez, yeah. that's crazy. I know, I know, like no one knows. Like, <laughs> no, fine, that's really lame, whatever. Yeah, every, um, everyone, when when they see you, when they hear of you, and, and worse, because mm. I guess that was going to be one of my questions when you speak about your mom, mm. the fact that you took the Mbofu mm. surname and you own it. I'm hoping if you don't cover it, I, I want to ask a question around that. But mm. everyone, yes, just sees, your, sees you and then thinks of your dad. Yeah, and... My mom gets silenced in that process, mm. right? So people will see me having a political opinion. They jump to some weird conclusion that somehow my dad has given me this opinion from I don't know where. Of course. And in that process, what we get is this assumption that people follow the most powerful man in their lives, no matter what they do. And in my own personal experience, it's really frustrating because mm. firstly, I grew up with my mom. Um, so I have a lot of love for my dad. Um, I always had a good relationship with him from the moment I was born, but I never actually lived with him. So I was brought up by my mom. But the funny thing is that people only see me through the prism of my father. And so my mother, if, if, you, if you want someone who really gave me my political opinions, it's probably my mother. Sure. Um, and she was an activist. She was a branch leader in the ANC. There's a funny story about how she actually beat my dad to a branch chairperson in the ANC. Um, and she is responsible in large part for, for my upbringing. So my parents had this pact that mm. my dad would always cover my education. So he paid for my education, mm. for which I'm always grateful. And my mom did the rest. Okay. You know? um, so an incredible woman, also an activist in the struggle against apartheid, an ANC activist until she also became disillusioned with the party. Mm. And in democracy, one of those unsung people, you know, for some reason, there are people who we always celebrate and then there are those who we, we forget. Yeah. And I always think like, why hasn't she been given the, the rewards and the honors she deserves for fighting against apartheid and in democracy working for racial justice. So she has a company where she's been working since 94 on questions of transformation in the workplace. So just an, an, a lovely, kind person, like someone who really touches a lot of people's lives um, and I, someone who, who's, who's a moral example to me too. I, I think your mom's story was waiting for you. And I think the responsibility falls on you mm. 
mm. to then tell a story. Because mm. to your question of why some people get the light and why some others, of course, it's largely driven by propaganda, mm. but propaganda is driven by people and the people tell the narratives. And true. depending on how strong a story it is for you, mm. um, it would be a request, at least from my side, if you feel her story is not told well enough mm. to please make an attempt and be like, guys, I'd like you to actually know about my mom. Um, yeah, yeah. I believe she deserves the same a uh, accolades as Abo Helen Joseph, mm. uh, Abo Mamwini Matikizela, etc. Because she did a lot of work. And worse on top of that, she's a white woman. So I'd like mm. to unpack mm. even that as well. Mm. Mm. You Definitely. and your mom spoke about politics growing up? Always. I mean, I grew up, I was born in 89. My, my father's being detained, taken away. My mom is an activist at the time. Yeah. They're ANC activists um, doing all kinds of things. And so like politics is how I come into the world. Mm. Their, their relationship is a political act. Both of them are taking flack because my mom's white, my father's black. Hey, it's 89. Born a crime. Trevor Noah. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. You know, and, and living through that particular moment through those two particular parents is al always how I've come to understand myself. Mm. And so my mom, and I have always had political discussions right from the beginning. And my parents together always tried to conscientize me from a very early age on political questions. And my mom and I still to this day constantly talk about what's going on. And we both are quite disappointed and disillusioned with mm. the current situation. Do you, do you know that that's not normal? I had to learn that that's yeah. not normal. I've sat yeah. with um, two of Jacob Zuma's daughters. Mm. Um, those two daughters happened to share a mom with... Mm. And both of them were like, our parents never spoke about politics and history at home. That's so interesting. And the one girl was like, I dated white guys. Mm. And it was only when I got to varsity and I started learning about this stuff, I was like, what the fuck? I'm yeah. at this danger. <laughs> when you sit with Tutuzane, for example, as well, mm. there's these assumptions, just as with you, that yeah. yeah, I'm sure your dad gives you intelligence and he hooks you up. It's mm. like, no, dog. Mm. Mm. I've been living my life. I was with my mom. I was living in Mozambique. Yeah. Um, and I'm getting to learn about this change like with the rest of you. Interesting. You know what I mean? So it's it's actually unique for parents, mm. not just in the political space, but in whatever profession. There are parents that are doctors, engineers. If you ask their children, what do your, does your dad do? Oh, I think he's a doctor. I'm not sure. Yeah. Don't yeah. you guys sit and discuss medical procedures? Yeah, we yeah, don't. Yeah. So that's it's pretty true. dope that your mom, it's true. and I guess your dad did that with you. And, and, and it's not normal. I need you to understand. Yeah, that's that's actually, it took me a while to realize that it, it wasn't normal. And I'm mm. very grateful to both of them. And, you know, the thing you say about telling people stories, um, I want to tell actually both of my parents' stories. Because mm. it, it's funny, although my father's really famous, very few people actually know his story. That's they, true. They just know, oh, they see him in court. He's representing one or other famous or controversial person. But... There's a story there that people don't know about someone who came from Duncan Village, lived in a one bedroom shack and left school to go and work in a Mercedes Benz factory when he was 16, was detained at the age of 17, went back to school in matric. He was his matric classes, maths teacher while he was a student. Crazy. And there was one scholarship for one black student in the country to go to university. And somehow from Danzane and Duncan Village, he got that scholarship. The boy. And if he, if, if he hadn't got that, like I wouldn't be sitting here, yeah. let alone becoming like one of the country's leading um, advocates. Mm. The struggle from, and then he got detained and then he became an activist, etc. So when people talk about him, they must, they must understand where he comes from before sure. they uh, run their mouths. And unfortunately, he's so busy, he doesn't have time to tell his story. Mm. Um, so maybe his story is not told um, and and for different reasons to my mom. But I'd love to tell the story of both of them because I think it's an interesting and important South African story, both of those lives. What's your mom's story? My mom grew up in the UK. Mm. She came to South Africa on a teaching trip and she thought she was going to be here for a few years. Like these kids that go to Asia now to teach English. <laughs> exactly. Okay. But it was like a long, long time ago. Like she came here on a ship. 
hectic. Yeah. And she fell in love with the country, mm. um, decided to stay. But the more she stayed in South Africa, she started appreciating the racial injustices mm. and eventually from a teacher became a lecturer at WITS, where I now lecture. Um, That's beautiful. By yeah. The way. Yeah. And she was then the warden of a residence called Barnato Hall at WITS, which is still there today. Mm. And that residence was a crucible for anti apartheid struggle, especially student activism in the 80s. Mm. That's where she met my dad, by the way, who was a student at that residence. That sounds scandalous. <laughs> it was the biggest scandal you can imagine, right? What's the age gap? Do you know? 14 years. 14. My mom is it's not my that bad, but yeah. still scandalous, yeah, especially yeah. at that age. No, it was a huge scandal. And people disowned her, and the university was in uproar. And sure. Um, they, they started dating while she was lecturing and while yeah. he was a student. Yeah, and she was his warden. Yeah. Olit <laughs> Lako God. Okay, sorry. Please carry on. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, particularly in that moment of ANC activism, of the UDF, um, of student activism in the country, mm. that residence, which was the first mixed race residence at WITS, mm. was a key place and she was the warden there. So often like senior people in the country or people you wouldn't imagine will come up to me and be like, I was at Barnato when your mom was the warden yeah. and she did this, this and this. She protected us when the police came. She did this, she did that. Um, so yeah, that, that's her story. And then democracy comes. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I think is important is we always talk about people who exploited their connections to the ANC to get money, to get power. Yeah. My mom could very easily have done that. You know, as I say, she was a branch chairperson at Unbanning. She was there before a lot of these mm -hmm. uh, people who came later. And she could very easily have become a minister, you know, become a tenderpreneur, yeah. But but she didn't. And there, there are a few people who who actually haven't exploited those those connections, who have actually been critical of the ANC when it's degenerated. So I also respect her a lot for for that. Why why do you respect her for that? Because it's easy. It's but really don't you think it was deserved? She'd fought opportunities are here. Mm. If they're meant to be distributed to people, should they not start with the people that understand? Because the assumption mm. is if your mom is invested in transformation. Yeah. If she gets the tenders and the deals, she mm. will make sure that the right type of work is done and it filters to the right people. I think they're... No, I, I don't think so. You think it would have corrupted her? Um, I think she would have had to take corrupt action or action that's adjacent to corruption mm. in order to secure that bag. Okay. And yeah, sure, that's the easy thing to do, but it's not necessarily the right thing to do. Is it not the deserved thing? So I wanna, I wanna know, is it possible if we assume mm. that this country is a crime scene and the people who are rich and privileged became rich and privileged through crime at mm. a grand scale, mm. the exploitation of people, the stealing of resources, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Mm. Is there a way to fix that without committing a counter crime? I think so. I think so. It depends what we mean by crime. Stealing um, back what was stolen. So maybe you need to be corrupt to fix certain things. Because trying to go through the right channels. See, le let's look at theft, right? Yeah. Theft is when you take something that doesn't belong to you. Yes. Um, if it's robbery by violent means or if it's not robbery fraudulently by, you know, deception or something. Yeah. But if you take something back that already belonged to you, I don't know if I would call that a crime. But that's what we call corruption today, is it not? No, no. I think what really belongs to South Africa is, or what really belongs to us or people who were stolen from mm -hmm. is land or the economic resources, the mineral wealth of South Africa. Um, it's not just state contracts and it's yeah. not just state money. So that's what I think truly belongs to us. And now the mistake that was made was instead of getting those things back, mm. we've plundered the state for our own personal ends. And then the other question is, what are you taking those things back for? True. Are you taking them back for 
yourself and your personal enrichment or are you taking them back for a wider social aim mm. so in those two senses i think corruption can be criticized and i get your point and and actually like in some ways yes mm. in some ways the resources just must go to to black people in south africa yeah but how is a key question and so when you just do the the quick easy thing of oh let me leverage my networks and get a tender and plunder the state you also doing something that's counterproductive because you're weakening the institution the state that's supposed to actually yeah. do the the redistribution in a in a wise way so you think your mom made the right decision i do and i'll always respect her for that and she doesn't have the wealth she doesn't have the fame mm. she doesn't have the notoriety but she has an example which she's left to us which we will always remember her surname is walsh that's her maiden name um, okay. so Oakley Smith is her surname. Her name's Terry Oakley Smith. Teresa Oakley Smith. Terry Oakley Smith. Mm. So you're Cesar and Paul Walsh, <laughs> and she's Terry Oakley Smith. I come from a complicated family, bro. Like crazy. Like, Where like does the Oakley Smith come from? So she was married to a man called John Oakley Smith. Uh, may his oh. soul rest in peace. Okay. And their relationship ended. They got divorced, but she kept his surname on. What does that make you a stepson? At um, some point. No, because the reason I'm asking yeah, is, were yeah. you Mpofu Walsh Oakley Smith at some point? No, I, I never was. I never was because that was before I was born. Okay. The, the relationship, um, okay. but again, but that family, the Oakley Smith family, um, like is connected to the Mpofu family and the Mpofu family and the Walsh family, and they span continents and it, it's a it's a complicated arrangement. But but that's like so many of us in South Africa, like this idea that. We have a mother and a father, mm. and and that's it. And there are no complications and past relationships and future relationships. Like, I've got four four siblings. I've got a brother, Lucian, who's from Oakley Smith. Okay. So he's white. He's white completely. But he's my brother through my mother. Okay. I've got other siblings in DC on my father's side. And then, so two older brothers, one black, one white, and then I've got two younger siblings yeah. from my father's current marriage. Um, so they're four siblings, different mothers. You're just that yeah. day walker in the middle. I'm the, I'm the person right in the middle. In yes, between. man. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about surnames? Because I, I think double barrel, and if they're going to quadruple barrel, mm -hmm. become ridiculous. Yeah. How do you feel about yeah. surnames in how they've morphed, number one, mm -hmm. and... Mm -hmm. My understanding of the African way of living is mm. that you would take not necessarily a surname, but the name of the person whose land you lived on and the clan or family that raised you. Mm. So if you weren't raised Kwampofu, mm. you'd have to be Walsh completely. You are raised by the Walsh, you identify as Walsh. Mm. What do surnames mean to you and why did you choose to keep your father's surname if you were living with your mom and raised by your mom? Yeah, that's an interesting thing. And you know, our names become conscious at a later point in our lives. So I think firstly, my mom mm. was always keen to make sure that my connection with my father was always there. So when I grew up, I knew myself as Mbofu Walsh and, and my name, that name was never kept away from me. Yeah. So I think in some ways my mom wanted to maintain my connection with my father and, and, and make me know that. Um, Walsh is is her side of the family. Mm. So I'd love to, and, and I guess at some points in my life, I've rationalized it as like, I chose this way, but in, in other ways, the name was given to me yeah. and, and I accepted it. Mm. And the reason I accept it like that, even though it's unconventional and on Twitter every day, someone asks me, why are you Mbofu Walsh? Where does the Walsh come from? Yes. Is that it shows that those two stories come together in me, mm. um, that I am my father's son, but I'm also my mother's son. Mm. And I want those two influences and parents to be represented when people know me. Mm. And that's, that's the only reason. A lot of women, maybe let's say African women, black African women, don't understand the significance of giving a child the father's surname. Mm. Because for a lot of black African men, it's almost the only thing they'll ever have mm. when it comes to the child, because mm. you know you gave birth to the child. You'll probably get to raise the child because we have a lot of single mother households. Sure. 
Um, and when a woman is like, I'm not even going to give you that, mm. it destroys a man. But at the same time, there's meant to be a responsibility. It can't just be that you identify with your dad. Yeah. Um, he has to play a part. Otherwise, he almost, again, whether it's a woman you're marrying or even a child, mm. which is something some people still don't understand. The whole concept is taking them from Johannesburg to Durban. So you were seized with Johannesburg because that's where you were raised and that's the family and you speak whatever language. Mm. And now Ulocholwa into the Durban family. Sure. Um, so a lot of guys still have this fascination wanting, it's like a label, I want to put a sticker mm. that this is mine, I mm. made it. Mm. Mm. Women don't understand the significance of that for men because outside of a paternity test, it's the only thing you can give us as men. Um, but at the same time, they also don't understand the responsibility. Outside of paying your fees, do you feel, understanding that he was a busy man, mm. that your father also added other value in your upbringing besides money? Yeah, absolutely. I think what I always got from my father and what I think is the first responsibility of any parent is I always knew how much he loved me. Mm. He always made that clear. Um, verbally? Verbally. Okay. Every time I speak to him on the phone, I'll end with, I love you. And he'll mm. say, I love you too. Um, and that's always been part of my life. And that 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 can't be underestimated. I never had to doubt that. Yeah. I knew, okay, he's not here. I'm not living with him. Maybe I only see him once a month. Did you understand um, why? I mean, I, I started to question it later in my life. It, mm. it was so normal because I never, I've never lived with him. Mm. Um, their relationship broke up when I was very young, mm. before I became even conscious. So. Okay. Later in life, I realized, oh, okay, so you don't just live with your mother. Uh, like there are people who live with both. Mm. Um, but he was always a regular fixture in my life. So mm. there was never a period where I, I didn't see him. Um, so I would see him and those interactions would always be really loving. Mm. And my parents, I realize now, always made a point of maintaining a friendship so that I could be raised. Yeah. So there was never any animosity um, that I obviously felt from my mom to my dad. Shout out and to your mom. Once again. I have to emphasize shout out to your once mom. Once again, like, uh, and that was so important for my identity because had she been like, Where, where's where's your father and, and all of this, I would have read it a different way. Mm. But on the contrary, she was like, you are Cizu and Bofu Walsh. Mm. Your father loves you very much. Um, he's coming to see you next week. You know, let's have dinner together and... So a shout out to your mom. Yeah, yeah. One of the major reasons children don't have relationships with their fathers is particularly because of the mothers. And this is not to ask mothers to be the bigger person, to deal with some type of abuse. And it's just there are women that understand the importance of identity, that understand the importance of doesn't matter how I feel. This is not just mine. This belongs to us. And this child at some point is going to need a lot of answers to a lot of questions and let the child develop. With their, let them not struggle later on when they're snorting cocaine and they're confused. This is important. So mm. I don't know if it's because she was a lecturer or just natural intelligence, but shout out to your mom for seeing the value and importance of that. Shout out to your dad for mm. coming through. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But yeah. I know normally that that thing starts from the mother mm. making mm. an effort for the child to have a relationship with the dad. Look, um, I know many other situations are, are different, mm. but in my case, I agree. My mom was very farsighted. Mm. My father was also farsighted and they made it work. Yeah. Um, and it could have gone horribly, horribly wrong. Mm. Remember, like the first five years of my life are even in a bar date while they're doing all of yeah. this. Um, so I got a lot of that from my dad. I would go and see him. Sometimes I'd go and stay with him. Um, I remember him taking me to his chambers sometimes when he was just starting as an advocate. Yeah. Um, he used to drive this yellow city golf. And like the old golf, golf the one. Old, you know, that box one. Yeah. Jeez. Um, so one day, Namanga Bange Golfer can be advocate Dalimpovo. Absolutely. And Jeez. Be like, a lo once again, it goes back to the stories. Yeah. Because. It's funny, like as my life has progressed, my parents have become more successful. Yeah. But there's a very big difference between that and those who are born directly into wealth. Yeah. Um, 
I'm not saying that's the same as those who are in poverty now, mm. but it's been interesting like watching those trajectories. Like my father, he first started with the Yellow City Golf. Yeah. Then one day he came to visit me in a Jetta, a red Jetta. Yeah. Then the big move was he came to visit me in a Benz. What? A red Benz. Now remember what I said, he worked. Why did he buy that car? He left school to work for a year as a welder in a Mercedes Benz factory. Yeah. Now he comes, he has a Benz. That's when I was like, whoa, he's doing, he's actually doing well. Mm. You know, I must have been nine or 10. Yeah. So at that point, my parents are still trying to, my mom was a lecturer at university and in those days they weren't paid very well. Mm. Um, so then slowly, surely, you know, now they're both quite financially secure. Welders that work at Mercedes-Benz cannot afford Mercedes-Benz's. Um, there's a lot of laborers in various spaces that can't afford the product that they work on. So I can only imagine how big that was for your dad. Mm. You know, yes, he didn't do it while he was working at Mercedes-Benz, but to, to be like, one day I will afford yeah. this car. Yeah. Even though I've helped to build it and whatever, I couldn't afford it. So I kind of need to do it for that type of affirmation that I'm mm. also worthy, like all the people that have come in here. So true. Just on that, bro, yeah. like I think there's something really important that we need to talk about, which is th there's this like this criticism often of black leaders yeah. of being flashy, of flaunting material things. And we dismiss it too quickly, I think, because mm -hmm. there, there's actually something quite psychologically important and different for a black person who's been deprived of those things systematically to actually say, I'm here. 100%. Right? Now, I, because my father already has the, uh, and, and did those things, I don't need to do that, right? Boom. But that doesn't mean that someone else doesn't need to do that. Mm. Um, so sometimes we have that conversation too quickly, like, oh, why are you flashy? Why are you flaunting? Mm. Well, actually, there's, there's like a deep trauma that we're trying to cover up through the possession of those material things. Mm. Whether that's right or wrong is, is a different question, but it's a much deeper question than just, oh, why, why are you flashy? We must ask like, why do these material things actually play yeah. a role into the history of like people's psychological um, predisposition? You're very right. It includes white women, by the way, um, because for an outsider, you would look at a Tokyo Sehwale at your dad and be like, maybe they also you want to drive a Benz, you want to have a white woman, and now you've got a half a gap. So you're like, boy, I'm going in. And for a lot of people, again, it's it's that affirmation of, I think I'm worthy. Why can't I be with a white woman? Why can't I wear this Italian brand? Why can't I drive this German car? Um, it's something that not only must we discuss, we need to understand it, unpack it. And then to what you're saying, you understand that you don't need that validation because you've seen it. Mm. For someone else, they mustn't, they must try and go through the journey without having to acquire. Yeah, yeah, for sure. To try and be like, I can acquire it, but I, I don't have to because I now understand mm. that I'm acquiring it f for whatever. And I don't need that because I've, I've worked on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know Doja Cat? Yeah, so, I, I, like, but. So Doja really Cat's like. dad is, he played a crocodile, I think, on Sarafina. Okay. Black dad, yeah, white yeah. Jewish mom in America. Mm, mm, mm. Um, the dad went to and performed there. I think he had two women with this two children with this woman he left the kids there she's become a superstar yeah, yeah. global Huge, superstar yeah. um there was something you mentioned that made me think of that uh, if you'd known the story mm. she was speaking to whoopi goldberg and like you know my, you acted with my dad and then the story came out of how this guy left america mm. and she didn't really grow up with him mm. etc and then he made an attempt to try and reach out to her and he mm. was like her team won't let me speak to her or whatever mm. but mm. for some of us it looked like you hadn't made a good enough effort yeah, yeah. Uh, to raise your children. And we see half a similar story with Drake, mm. raised by a white Jewish mom, had a black dad who was a pimp sure. as well. You know, uh, I don't know if you identify with mixed race stories. Mm. We've got Trevor Noah, mm. Alicia Keys, Mariah Carey, Naomi Osaka, um, all all these guys that have mixed race parents. Shoma Josie. Yeah. Um, I sometimes feel like you guys are forced to get like a default PhD in <laughs> culture and identity yeah. and yeah. figuring yourself out and that other kids don't have. And you guys almost develop the superpower 
by accident of mm. now I have to understand both sides and myself within the space. So I'm, I become more sensitive than the next person. Mm. Do you have any thoughts around mixed race? And mixed race, I understand to be different from colored in this country. And do you identify with mixed race kids, at least the, mm. the more popular ones? Yeah, you're right. It, it's funny how the the father seems to be like constant in those in those stories. Mm. Like I hadn't thought of it like that. And I don't necessarily identify with that story to the extent that I think my father put in enough effort. Yeah. Um, maybe it wasn't perfect, but I, as I say, I always felt like he's there yeah. and he there's love and there's support and there's financial support too. And know? he did his best. He did his best. Which is very important in, within circumstances. Yeah, in difficult circumstances. Yeah. So um, that's why there's no real deep resentment there yeah. and, and there's love there and there always will be. Um, but you're right. Like there's something very unique and different and rare and strange mm. because we live in such a racially pol polarized society when you have a family connection to both of those poles mm. you you have to navigate and figure that out and the the hard thing you know i, I can i can intellectualize it as much as much as you want right yeah. but just to talk about personal experience mm. the the really hard thing about when you're trying to navigate that identity is no one can give you a handbook because even your family doesn't know. Yes. So like the black side of your family can't be like, yeah, we can tell you what to do because- We understand, they, you so, don't. Exactly. So if I sit at a, a table with my mom and my dad, mm. I'm different to both of them. Yes. And you would think that's the most intimate relationship you have. That's where you, you find your sameness, right? Mm. But if I go and visit my mother's family, I'm the only black person there. Yeah. If I go and visit my father's family, at Kukwala, I get called umlung, you know, and I'm, I'm, I stick out like a sore thumb, yeah. but I am of them too. So you have to come to terms with being different mm. all the time. And you never get that um, sanctuary of, I'm with people who are like me. Mm. But at the same time, you develop this kind of very uh, sophisticated ability to understand and fit in mm. and not be excluded, let me say, in, in, in a whole range of places. Yeah. So I can also go to an all white space and hold my own and, you know, figure out the little ways to become accustomed and, and make the jokes, you know, that will make me welcomed in that space and vice mm. versa. So you have breadth, but yeah. you don't necessarily have depth of, uh, of understanding. Do you think mixed race kids have a higher probability of certain types of success in particular because they have to make a greater effort in different spaces than the average child who's just chilled with, ah, mm. I'm black, we're black. The mixed race child has to try harder to be more black, mm. has to try harder to be more white in spaces. So they end up, I don't know, in various ways, maybe even excelling, mm. maybe even wanting to prove a point. Just because I'm mixed race doesn't mean I'm not brilliant at sports, yeah. um, cultural items, language academics etc hmm. that's a really interesting question i think like on the one hand you you have a lot to prove when you come into the world like that mm. and you find ways to prove it right and one of the ways to prove it is you achieve things and you say despite the fact that i'm so different from you mm. i was able to achieve this thing are you the most successful of your siblings all of them from um, a generic success perspective. I mean, it, it depends what you mean by by success. I, I don't know how to. How Are you to the most popular? That. Do you make the most money? Um, probably, probably not really. Okay. But but you know, yeah, I, I don't know how to how to really answer that. Are you being humble or being weird? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I look at six, Trevor six, Noah's story. Yeah, Trevor's yeah. got siblings. Yeah, but they're not Trevor. Mm. And you look mm. at some of these other mixed race kids where the mom or the dad had other kids elsewhere, they tend to excel beyond those kids. Um, of course, these are isolated success stories. So I don't yeah. even know if there's a theory there, but I'm just, um, so I'm just wondering from your personal perspective, how, you know what, how more dynamic you are yeah. than your siblings. No, no, I'm not, I'm not more dynamic. Um, I guess it just depends on how we define success. Yeah. The, 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 the obvious things, did, did any of them go to Oxford and get a PhD? No. 
Um, but, oh boy, flex. But, <laughs> but like, I, I think success is probably something more than that. Mm. Um, but yeah, like I, I guess in my family, I had, um, I had something not just in my family, but from the day I was born, I had to, mm. I had to prove that I know I'm different from you, but I'm, I'm also, don't worry, mm. you know? Um, and one of the ways to do that, I think, um, was to try and achieve things, you know, to say mm. like. Are you proud of uh, your PhD from Oxford? Does it feel like success to you? I asked this yeah. in particular because you have intelligent parents. Mm. And I sometimes always think, if your parents are well accomplished, quite intelligent, etc., yeah, yeah. do you see it as, oh, geez, fuck, I got my PhD, or is it like, well, yeah. come on, this is what we do at home? <laughs> I really am, you know. It's probably like the one outward achievement mm. where I really am proud of it. And I'll tell you why. Firstly, can I clear something up? Because this just needs to be said. Yeah. So I told you that my father paid for my education, and I'm very glad for that. He yes. did not pay for my Oxford education. So okay. everyone keeps like trying to abuse me on social media by saying like, yeah, but your dad okay. just sent you to Oxford. So like, what do you No, I got a scholarship to Oxford. On Congrats and well done. Thank you. On yeah. academic merit. Yeah. You think this, this, the selection committee looked and said, oh, he's Dali Mbofu's son in Oxford. Like, sure. yeah. So it was, look, I got a lot of advantages in life. My father paid for an education. Um, but I've exploited those advantages, yeah. right? And is that is that you or were you taught to exploit them? Um, I think it, 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 a lot of it came from me. Okay. And shout out to you. And thank you. And like, you'll see a lot of struggle children mm -hmm. or people who have famous parents. Yeah. Actually, find find it very difficult. You know, um, there's drugs. There's there's just depression because living in that glare mm. is is not an easy thing to do so so the oxford thing like really was my uh my proudest achievement in terms of like intellectual things because mm. when i got to oxford nobody gave a damn whose son i was yeah. right nobody knew who dalim bofu is yeah and so it was an experiment for me to see, hold on, how much of what I'm doing is people actually just giving me that, that benefit of the doubt, yeah. right? And I'm sure a lot of it in South Africa was. But if I got to that place and I succeeded, mm. then maybe there is actually something separate from that, yeah. right? And when you go to Oxford, remember, I remember sitting down in the first meeting, this was for my master's before I started the PhD. Mm. And they had this thing where everyone had to say where they came from. And we were just sitting around this table. Oh, I come from Harvard. I went to Cambridge. I went to MIT. I went to Columbia. And they came to me and I was like, I was at UCT. And they're like, sorry, where? Where's the that? University of, of Cape Town. And they're like, oh, very nice. Very yes. nice. You know. So I was competing with the best in the world. Mm. Right. And the first year was tough like really tough like these people are smart penwell okay like the competition was tough the comp like let me let me give you an example because i was th there are a lot of people watching this who want to study further want to go to places like oxford yeah. um and they haven't been given the codes and the keys so so like let's talk about that right okay so you get there you're used to a big class or or a seminar room right mm. my first class um i remember this got given some readings. It's with this world-renowned professor. Yeah. Right. We had to go up the spiral staircase at the top of some tower, right? You get into this building. There's a wood. Sounds like Hogwarts. It's literally Harry Potter. It's literally like that, right? Yeah. You open the door. There's this ancient library, this boardroom, and this professor sitting there. And there are like five or six of us. And we have to talk for two hours about what we've read and the professor's like come in let's let's discuss yeah and they put you through your paces like what did this person say no no you're wrong about this you're wrong about that mm. and like the first year i was just like 
I don't know if I'm cut out for this. You, you were know? seeing flames, boy. Seeing flames. Seeing flames. Yeah. And then that's quite exciting, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you feel, you feel your 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 mind expanding and stretching and going to places it, it hasn't been, and you rise to the occasion. Yeah. And to be admitted for a PhD, like you have to be, they have to see that even within this class mm. of people in the masters, these few are going to get the highest degree. Yeah. You know, here, and even then. Um, and this is the last story I'll tell because I was at the beginning, at the end of the process, right? Yes. So I write this thesis. It's a hundred thousand words, which is like a really, really long book, <laughs> right? <laughs> I like the uh, way you put that. Just so people know, guys, yeah. it just means it's a really, really like you know thick, one of those big, thick ones, yeah. Um, and the way it works at Oxford when you get your PhD is you write your thesis and then you have to do what's called a viva, mm -hmm. which is your oral defense. So again, two world experts mm. in the thing you've just written this, this thesis about, yeah. sit down and they go through your thesis mm. and they pick it apart and they say, what about this? Tell us about this footnote. Mm. Why did you refer to this person? What about this inconsistency? Mm. What about this for three hours? Jeez. Now, you are, now you're now you outnumbered by the professors, yeah. right? It's not like three of you and one professor. It's like two professors and one of you. Yeah. And, they, and if you can withstand that scrutiny, you go out of the room, they deliberate, and you come back in the room and they say, congratulations, doctor, or not. Jesus you know? Christ. You know, you know yeah. we, I don't think we celebrate academic achievement enough. So, so true. We claim to be an education obsessed country, which we're not, mm. and our education is pretty pathetic. So true. Um, but I'm listening to you now for normal, the majority of kids in South Africa. Mm. You could be someone telling us of how your first year playing for Barcelona, yeah, and everyone's coming from Brazil and Portugal, exactly. and you're just in Tuana, <laughs> you know, yeah, and yeah. even. Let's say from a music perspective, mm. oh, Tuson Bedu, mm. my first time mm. in Hollywood and I'm bumping into this person. Absolutely. And now you're sitting with this world-renowned yeah. director and yeah. they're yeah. sitting with a casting director mm. and they, and it's literally that. And I don't think we celebrate it the way we should. And sadly, academics are lame and boring losers. Yeah. So <laughs> you guys tend to also suck at selling. Guilty as charged. Yeah. To, to sell how dope yeah. this is, to yeah. be like, I love analogies to yeah. be like the people that were interviewing me are like the equivalent of James Cameron who directed the Titanic exactly and Christopher Nolan who did yeah. the Dark Knight trilogy yeah. Yeah. the guys I was with in class became the academic equivalent of Lionel Messi yeah. and yeah. Cristiano Ronaldo some of the policies that you'll yeah. the reason you walk this way the yeah. reason we the reason our constitution is because of that guy I was in yeah. school with him so yeah. it's yeah. it's that dope Absolutely. So shout out to you for telling us that story. No, that's a good way of putting it. Next time I tell the story, I'm going to tell it like that. Please. And um, is there anything beyond PhD? Um, no. Um, like that's in terms of degrees. Yeah. That's that's it. And and with a PhD, there's no mark at the end. Yeah. It's either you're a doctor or you're not. And it's decided by people. It's decided by people. And that moment, bro, where you're, you're, you're outside that room and you've tried to defend what you've done and yeah. they hold it in your hands. They literally either tell you, nice try or you're a doctor you know and like and believe me there's no there's no freebie there sure if you're not a doctor you're not a doctor yeah um so yeah it's and and i agree with you and i mean i'm telling my story mm. but there there are a lot of south africans in these places who are doing incredible academic things yeah. you know they're at oxford they're at harvard even in south african institutions doing amazing things mm. and we don't celebrate them like look at how much celebration we do of celebrities yeah. and i'm not saying we shouldn't like there's they're incredible musicians yeah. they're incredible uh sports people but like as you say the people who are doing these things in these spaces are doing just as important things and maybe their their legacies will live even longer yeah and we don't know their names we don't celebrate them brands or whatever don't yeah. and, and if we actually had a culture of that celebration where would we be i agree uh I used to be a nerd, but uh, I wanted to say something on what you were saying. I used to 
my brother did philosophy at varsity mm. and mm. I used to think philosophy was a pile of garbage. Uh, hippie kids that like smoking weed and <laughs> discussing airy fairy crap. Yeah. When you start studying the history of almost anything, politics, business, you see how influential philosophers have been in almost every aspect of society. Religion. So true. So when you speak about musicians, speak about actors, a lot of the spaces they play in mm. are affected by academics and intellectuals from their legal contracts to some of the technology they use. You could be a singer, but you're using a mic that was designed by someone. Yeah. And that someone will tell you, I was once reading a thesis or I was, you know, mm. Steve Jobs and what he created with uh, Apple, as much as I, I think he's a tertiary dropout, I'm not too sure. But mm. Mm. when he links back to, we changed fonts on, on the MacBook, the computer, mm. like one mm. Mm. font. And I did that because I studied calligraphy. Yeah. That, that is a, like, it's an academic uh, craft um, and I studied this thing. Mm. If you look at, hey, you are and you're like, there are people that study this stuff, that mm. design that stuff. And mm. uh, we need to make it cooler. And yeah. I guess that's a challenge for, for you guys uh, you know, in some way. That, that's really, that's really true and really interesting. And I'm, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, and I think one other thing I'd like to say is that when, when you go to a place like Oxford and you get a PhD from Oxford, right? Mm. It's the highest degree from the highest university. Yeah. Um, you also nonetheless understand, ironically, that it really doesn't matter where you study or what you've studied. Mm. Knowledge is knowledge. Okay. So you start seeing in people who maybe haven't done the formal academic thing, which mm. is just one route to knowledge, right? Yeah. You start being able to identify, oh, that, that person has has knowledge yeah. like it, you don't have to go to oxford you don't have to do a phd you have to be in love with knowledge yes that's all you know just because someone rubber stamps that you're in love with knowledge that's mm. great but i wouldn't want to leave the impression on people that that's the only route mm. you know so i look i look at this this is this is a phd like content creation doing that yeah. solidly for five years that's knowledge that's things you have to learn and understand so whether you do it through the formal channels or the informal channels, mm. I don't think matters as much as have you had this deep intellectual journey mm. into different subjects and into different forms of knowledge. Mm. And if you can do that, then you can do anything. Because if you can learn something, you can learn anything. If you learn how to learn, then you can learn anything, right? You released a hip hop track, which was kind of like a diss track of Umsholozi. I think it's called Dear President. Yeah, yeah. And then years later, you sat with him, mm. speak about formal and informal knowledge. Mm. Uh, did your perception on him change after sitting with him at all? Mm. Um, have you analyzed him in terms of what people call his lack of intelligence? Um, I never, I never thought he wasn't intelligent. Okay. Um, I think he's, he's a person of deep intelligence. Mm. I don't think you can rise to the level of... Even when you released the district. Oh, yeah, yeah. I always knew. And I, I okay. never said anything in that track, sure. which was that he wasn't intelligent. Okay. Um, and, and I have to say, I think there are different kinds of ways we can criticize politicians in South Africa. Yeah. And there's, there's this racist attempt sometimes to say like black politicians are not intelligent or, or they're too flashy and... and it's very convenient racism. So right? convenient. Yeah. So convenient. But you can criticize their decisions of or course. you can criticize corruption. Of course. You know? um, so, because uh, apartheid was, uh, the policy I think was drafted by, may have been a PhD. Oh, there were many PhDs. One of yeah. your people. The exactly. PhDs are the ones that brought exactly. apartheid. Exactly. It was the uneducated yeah. guy that brought transformation. For no, I'm joking. For Wood himself mm. had a PhD. Um, highly educated mm, apartheid mm, and then this supposedly uneducated president mm, was loved by black people mm, exactly mm. so I think um, President Zuma is strategically a strategic genius okay I mean the way he outmaneuvered former president Mbeki in 2007 was one of the one of the biggest moves in South African political history yeah um, but I think his presidency was something of a disaster mm. um, for various reasons. So 
it's weird because when you're creating content, you're doing something a little different to just giving your opinions, right? Yes. You probably have like a thousand opinions about what I've said. Of course. That you're choosing because it's not always the right thing to be like, oh, I disagree with that. That's sure. that's just stu stupid. Caesar. Sure. Why would you say that, right? But sometimes you, you have to do that. Yeah. So, so now I'm in a completely different position where I've criticized him politically. Mm. But now I have to interview him which is a totally different thing and be polite and professional yeah exactly yeah and um as i was saying with Nkululeko, um i don't know if we said this on camera or off camera but when you're interviewing someone you want to get certain things out of them mm. for your audience yes so you're not always gonna just go on the attack and be like no that's wrong and that's wrong and then you did this and you did this and you did this right yeah you're, you're sometimes gonna have to try and say tell me about this sure. right Caesar, tell me about your father, yes. you know? And uh, the experts know how to get the things out, right? Yeah. So I had to not necessarily impose my view yes. on his presidency, but rather try and make him comfortable enough to share. Yeah. And he shared a lot. He shared a lot in that interview. And it's actually one of the last interviews he's done. Yeah. And I think that interview will be a historical record yeah. for a very, very long time. Because he said a lot of things in those in, in that interview that people haven't fully appreciated, which he hasn't said in other places. Did your perception of him change at all after that? In weird ways. Mm. So I have to say, I went to his house in Joburg. Mm. And I had, I had heard all these stories of spectacular corruption and capture, right? And I was expecting this palace, of course, right? And it was this very humble place, like just sparse furniture everywhere. And I was like, <laughs> if corruption happened here, yeah, it didn't go well. <laughs> um, so that was like, and of course, I mean, very few people I'm sure go into that kind of intimate space, but I was like, okay. Yeah. Um, I would have, I would expect more flaunting, yes. you know. Um, I was also keenly aware that he wasn't well. Okay. Um, so, so I think, I mean, he's he's made it. It's public knowledge mm -hmm. that he uh, suffers from some chronic illnesses. Um, and so, when you see someone face to face in the interview. Mm. I ended the interview at some point because I was like, I don't want to keep you here for hours and yeah. hours and hours, you know. So that was also interesting to me. So what I expected, like this powerful leader who's like super rich and has billions dashed everywhere under yeah. every possible Mattress. article of furniture, <laughs> side eye. Um, I got this like picture of a vulnerable person who's quite old, yeah, quite frail. Um, in this like sparse house and mm -hmm. I was like whoa mind blown you yeah know? Um, and then I also there's also this thing of he's this very gregarious person and he's friendly and yes. he's warm and I also didn't get that I was like maybe he had he'd heard the song <laughs> um, uh, there was I didn't know how to break the ice so I was like I went to uh, school with your daughter yes um, and he was like yes she told me and I was like, what else did she tell you? Did Jeez. she tell you about the song? Um, but he, he was just like, he was nice, but he wasn't like going out of his way to be super mm. welcoming. So all those stories that I'd heard didn't um, check out with my experience. It, it doesn't mean that like my one little anecdotal hour with President yeah. Zuma is the full reflection of him. Yeah. But there's something interesting that happens when you meet people face to face. As and and that's why I love being able to interview people. Sure. Because you have this image of someone that you see on social media, and then you meet them, and sometimes it confirms, and sometimes it it it's just different. Um, so yeah, those were my impressions. I've never met anyone white, black, poor, rich, politician otherwise in this country who has had a bad experience with Umsholozi one-on-one. Mm. Never. Yeah. They can be like, that decision was so stupid. I don't know what he was doing. What the hell? True. He's corrupt. But they're like one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. It's game down. He, you cannot so true. fight with him, argue with him. He disarms mm. everyone. Or mm. Helen Zilla or anyone. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's genius. It is. 
That's intelligence. I'm even thinking about the fact that the I'm very big on psychology, propaganda, mm. branding, perception. Mm. The fact that you're coming to this humble abode. Yeah. That Brilliant. something like that would knock you out Completely. of the Completely. Imagine. Like, Uz Uzuma mastered something that I think Nelson mastered, mm. Mm. which is don't have money. Yeah. Just have money around you mm. all the time. Very so true. that you're like, guys, I have nothing. As you yeah. can see, yeah. if you're getting a tears, I'm mm. not mad. Mm. Mm. But all my friends. Sure. And then you see where I sleep at night. I'm like, no, I'm just visiting my friend. My friend has a palace. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> I don't have anything. Yeah. Which is pretty dope. No, that that's really true. And and like when we speak of intelligence, I think former President Zuma is maybe the, the master of social yeah. intelligence and political intelligence and knowing how to disarm, how to make the right people feel comfortable when they need to feel comfortable. And yeah, it was it was it was fascinating. I have to say, and you know. There, there are two categories of people, and I happen to have seen both categories, who mm. are social geniuses. Mm. It's musicians and celebrities yeah. and politicians. Yeah. If you meet Casper or you meet some famous person, they will make you feel like you are the most impo important person. Yes. The social intelligence, that's how they navigate through the world yeah. and build those networks with the with the radio stations and all of that to finally amass that that yeah. celebrity status. And politicians are exactly the same. And there's something similar about about both of them. You're very right. Tutuzani Zuma spoke Portuguese for many years living in Mozambique. He hmm. kind of can't speak it at all now. Okay. I didn't know that. He's trying to learn Isi Zulu. Hmm. Every now and then he attempts it in a crowd and it goes kind of left. <laughs> Uh, but he's trying to learn his Zulu. So Tutuzani Zuma speaks English, generally, flat out. Okay. Why did you choose to learn his Kosa? Um, so And when did you start learning his Kosa? Mm. So with my parents and the story that we've already told, mm. I grew up with my mom, right? But I'm always mindful that I'm also my father's son and there's this whole aspect of who I am mm. that I haven't been able to explore because my parents have been apart for my if, whole life. Before you continue, I'm mm. going to forget this point. Lewis sure. Hamilton, after winning some major thing, said something along the lines that he's going to get a double barrel surname in honor of his mother who raised him. And I remember when Interesting. he said that, I thought of you immediately. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't Sorry. see that. Yeah. Please continue. No. Another mixed race child that's doing phenomenally yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to the mixed race kids. Hashtag mixed race mafia. Boom. <laughs> you guys are capturing the country. <laughs> so, yeah, like I always wanted to. So sometimes m my dad would take me in December to go and visit my family and, and all of that. And there was this barrier because I couldn't speak as close at all. Mm. Right. So I, <laughs> my parents are funny, but I always knew I have to go to the mountain. So I live with my mom mm. and my mom is also like, nah, you have to go to the mountain because that's part of who you are. Your mom is so dope. Mm. She really is. Mm. Not so, the going to the mountain thing. Yeah, yeah, no. Your mom was not dope for that. <laughs> yeah, she should yeah. have actually been I like, no, uh, you're half British. We don't do, <laughs> these, we don't do these, these things. Um, so yeah, like, and that's by the way, also where my accent comes from because yeah. my mom is British. She has like a British accent. Yeah. So just to clear up again, this is how I talk because that's literally how that's I- That's how my mom, yeah. this is my mother tongue. Exactly. Literally. My mother, literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so now I'm 17 and whatever, and it's mm -hmm. like, okay, so you have to go to the mountain, right? It's like, okay. Were you scared? I was literally, all the years of my life up to that point, I was like, I hope they abolish this practice before I turn 18. I'm gonna fucking I hope they chop my dick off. What the <laughs> fuck? I'm gonna die. I'm gonna be one of the stats. Yeah, it's and it's real. Like you, yeah. you do have those. We can have a whole conversation sure. about, um, you know, going Esutwini and and Udwaluko. Mm -hmm. um, so we sit we sit around the table dinner. My dad comes one night and they're like, okay, you know what? You need to go and live. Ekutwala, learn Istosa, and then at the end of that year, you'll go to the mountain. This was your dad and who? And my mom. And we're sitting around the table. You're conspiring one for nonsense. You know? You're like, no, I don't vote for this. At that point, I'm a rapper. Boy, shout out to Entity. <laughs> you know this. You know this. Uh, I'm in matric mm. at St. John's, right? 
Shout out to St. John's, my yeah. my brother's firstborn goes there. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Great. It should not we're privileged. I wouldn't know. I didn't know hey, we were privileged hey. until my brother sent his boy to St. John's. I was like, <laughs> hey, well, actually, no, this is not, that no, I don't no. know about. Cle- clearly, this show is doing the thing. So, wow. No, wow. not this show. Not <laughs> no, no, me, no, no, it's fine. We, we already know. We my already kids, know. no, my kids study. <laughs> Shit, I'm about to lie. Anyways, shout out to St. John's. Mm. So you had St. John's College with at that Kieran point, Forbes and Untlantla. Kieran Forbes, yeah, Untlantla. Um, many other people, actually. Yeah. Uh, like, there are a lot of uh, well-known people who I was at school with um, because that's how privilege works in those schools. Of course. Um, that's how you ended at Oxford. Mm-hmm. Of course. Because you're uh, privileged. It's because you're British. Actually, your family <laughs> exactly. were colonized. I'm kidding. My, wife, my wife always teases me because she's like, what's going to happen with the land? Like, you took the land yes. and you lost the land. So now, must, must we give you land? Must we take it away? Do you get half the land? Like, what's going on? Jeez. So, yeah. Um, so, so that's what happens. Mm. The parents are sitting you down at dinner and they're like, yeah. you have to go next year to Islalin. After, after matric, you're going Islalin. So For how long? For a year. I don't understand. Is that like a gap year thing? <laughs> yeah, that was my gap year. Is Lalin. Mm. Mm. So, and for that reason, Entity broke up. Are you serious? Yeah, because I left Joburg. I left to go and connect with my family in the Eastern Cape. It's crazy. Otherwise, I suspect we would have carried on on that path and I would have gone the hip hop route and all of that um, fully. So, like, thanks to you, AKA is a big deal now. Otherwise, he'd be seeing flames. I mean, I, I didn't want to say it, but to basically... To vice versa, fucking shut up. And AKA would probably, like, a backing rapper there. I mean, we all know I was the better rapper. <laughs> in Entity. Like, it's... He knows that. Come on. He know, And and Ntlantla was actually the best, I would say. Sure. And he knows we that, too. We won't, speak <laughs> about, we won't speak about that. <laughs> anyway, sorry. No, so, no, Entity no. broke up literally because... Yeah, Entity broke up that year. We That kind of sucks. We had... Let, let me give the hip hop heads some some gold yeah. that maybe one day will get dug up. We recorded a second album, Entity. That has never been released? I, I have that album or I have the songs. You're the only one? Um, I think so. I don't know if, I don't think Kenan has them. I think it's like- You're the only one? Such a colonizer. You wanna hold the resources? No, no, what? <laughs> like, what Hi, Baba. like we would need the, cons- uh, like- No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. Um, so we recorded a whole second album. Are you going to release it? I don't think so because we, we don't really talk much anymore. Before you um, carry on with your journey, yeah, before yeah, I yeah. forget. So yeah. we're not going to necessarily speak about Entity. Mm, sure. You guys signed when you were still in high school, which mm. is pretty dope. Mm. Um, I was watching, so I've had a conversation with Tubu Uche, Unsiga, Master P, yeah. uh, even Usam Gale on the story of the soil. I don't know if you know it at all. Mm. But I remember... They started off as an a cappella group. Mm. Later on, Sam Gelo went on his own journey, mm. I guess, of self discovery, whatever the case may be. Mm. And I know this year they performed, uh, 2022, they performed together, mm. the four of them. And I, I remember being emotional because yeah, wow. I'd been emotionally invested in them and their success. Yeah, yeah. So in my head, I'm just, I guess there's a small wish. Whether it's just one concert, mm. we've seen it with the TKZ. It would be super dope for you guys to do like um, a show or a tour, yeah. aka Untlant and yourself and any of the other guys that were involved in mm. Entity, because I think there were six of you mm. initially, mm. any of the other guys involved, um, even if it's just for nostalgia's sake, yeah. because yeah. people emotionally invest, not just with the group, but with you guys as individuals. And mm. the idea of you guys being on one stage is, we saw it with White, um, Lauren Hill and the Fugees, mm. Dave Chappelle's blog party. So. From my side, it's a hope. I'm speaking it into the universe. Yeah, yeah. I hope you guys release the album and it would be pretty dope if you guys, even if it's just one night, mm. just mm. do a, a concert together with the gents. The, anyway, sorry. The, Back the world, to his Lalin and the dryness. You never know. Um, and how wow. you lost your dick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how I lost my dick was. <laughs> um, yeah, so... so the, so then I was like, yeah, okay. Um, you agreed. I guess, I guess I do have to learn. It's closer. I like get something I want to do. I have to damn go to this mountain. You couldn't speak it at all at that point. Um, no, like okay. I mean, I did Zulu at school and stuff. But okay. as I said, like I grew up in a house with a white British mother. Yeah. Who calls me Seasway? <laughs> <laughs> um, so have you got a second name? 
like a, a slave a slave name yeah michael oh yeah. okay michael and then uh my parents um the full name they actually gave me is Sizwe Sandile. So the nation has grown. Okay. Yeah. Sizwe Sandile. Yeah, Sizwe Sandile, yeah. Um, so I left mm-hmm. straight after my trick. I went to Ezlalin to go and live with my family there. Which area is this again? It's in a place called Kukwala. Kukwala. Which is just outside King Williamstown. At okay. Kwame. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, I spent most of the time there. I was also, I spent some time uh, in my Linda with a cousin of mine and an aunt of mine, shout out to Uputsili yeah. and Udabs, Udabs Wam. Um, and yeah, I, I remember landing mm. in East London and I got in the car and they were like, welcome. We're not gonna speak English to you after this because yeah. our mission is now that you must learn is closer. Um, so no one spoke to me in English for that year. Mm. And again, the first few months were just like, what's happening? Mm. I remember there was a funny situation as, um, at Kukwala where like I was sitting in this room and then some uncle came to me and he, he said some long thing in his mm. class and I was like, okay. So I went to the kitchen and I came back with oranges. And they're like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> it said nothing about oranges. I was like, uh, okay, sorry. So like, yeah, just being in that situation and slowly um, I picked the language up, but I, but I have to say like one year is, is not enough. Mm. As I they say. Imagine. So how, how mm. what were you doing every day? I would literally herd cattle in the mm. morning, mm. go herd cattle, come back. And then there was um, a primary school there in the in the village yeah. which ironically my father had gone to um and because it's our family village yeah and so i taught a little bit taught english in that primary school in the days that's brilliant yeah and then just read i read a lot you were like a missionary just carry on with your <laughs> a missionary in my, and heritage in my like, own what you yeah do. like a, li- a missionary i'll in teach my you guys family. english and i'll name <laughs> yeah. you nelson one day you will become a president <laughs> exactly i'll name you nelson mbofu yes <laughs> Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And then at the end of that year, I went um, I went to the mountain and then then I went to UCT after that. Mm. Yeah. Have you had more rites of passage? Because the Oxford looks like it was a baptism of fire mm. and being in a completely different space, mm. swimming in the deep end, again, self-introspecting, finding yourself, asking a lot of hard questions. Yeah. Going to Eslalini, same thing. Maybe arguably um, even being part of Entity and the, mm. the journey that you guys were on. Mm. Have you had any more of, of those? And and do you feel they've... Because they're potentially traumatic. Mm. Do you think they've been good for you? Or are you, do you just feel like you are lucky to get out of them and you're still sane? I think there's there's a bit of both. Mm. That, that period, uh, Eslalini for a year was traumatic. Mm. It was really traumatic just to be brought face to face with the poverty of my family, which Mm. I knew uh, academically or Mm. intellectually. But again, it's this thing of stories of of successful black people that we don't tell. Like the momentum of apartheid is too much for any of us to bring our entire families out of out of poverty. You can only do a portion. Yeah. And the rest get left behind. True. You know, so I would go at Kukwala and I'd see, like, obviously this is basically, the whole village is kind of extended family mm-hmm. for those who are not familiar. And and so you see people with the same features as you and, and as, as my dad, you know, and, but you see the poverty and you're like, that's that could have been my dad yeah. very easily, you know. Um, One, two, three decisions. It, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's why I will never begrudge him for... The car he drives or or the fee he charges mm. because i know what it took to get to where he is i want to ask that so bad please carry on yeah cool um Shit, i want <laughs> but you, you probably can't say please carry on no no sure how um, much does you please carry on no I, I don't know how much he charges exactly. i've heard rumors of how much he charges yeah but no, i think i'll yeah. ask i'll ask him this and i know he won't answer but i'll ask it nonetheless no, yeah yeah but like he he charges as much as a 
a good SC, senior counsel charges in South Africa. Hey, whatever yeah. that means, man. The rumors I've heard are crazy. But no, I think a, continue. No, no. I think a good SC charges like I think with tax like 50 50k a day or something like that or something like that. 50,000 rand a day. Yeah. Okay. This is not going to be an official conversation. I'll, I think so. I'll like hopefully I, I, have I don't, this one. I don't I'll know. I suppose we sit with your dad uh, mm. a couple of weeks if not a couple of mm. months ago with mm. DJ Spoo. Oh nice. On the Hustlers Corner slash oh, yeah, virtual yeah. Kuku. And on that day your dad confirmed in the morning and I already had other scheduled ah, stuff. Yeah, so I yeah. missed out, um, no, which made good. me very, very sad. Oh, good. Yeah, I but. think, like, as I say, I don't know, but I think that's around where advocates' fees are. And again, just on this conversation, like, mm -hmm. when a white advocate charges that amount to represent Janus Walus, yes. right? We, we say nothing. We don't bat an eyelid because that's what advocates get paid. And it's expected. And it's expected. And they're white. And they're white. So yeah. they deserve the right amount. But when a black advocate, who, by the way, has lifted himself up from the poverty that apartheid created around mm. him, stands up and says, I want to get paid not more, the same. Mm. And he's one of the advocates that wipes the floor with the rest of them. Exactly. Yeah. We have a problem with it. It's a. It, it's one of the conversations we'll need to have, along with the we other one do. we spoke about, about we Flash, do. about our... Um, yeah unhealthy traumatic weird understanding of money mm. um who deserves money for what so true. can we quantify value mm. does this person deserve this because i remember simon sinek in one of his talks was like if you were to put a value on nelson mandela and mother Teresa, mm. how much do you think they should be charging an hour for the value they give to the world mm. you know and would it be comparable to something else because yeah. for me at least um I would like as many people as possible because of how money has traumatized so many people mm. to move from money to value. Yeah. Once we can be like, this is the value, then it becomes easier to assign money. If you're like, I don't see this value, then don't assign the money. So true. Too many of the people that have colonized, oppressed other people have mm. extracted so much value, real value from people mm. in exchange for a little bit of money. And because That's people don't, uh, assign money to value it becomes this warped mm. kind mm. of thing and but anyways and, and what we must stop doing as well is saying that the only for authentic form of blackness mm. is poverty let me look at the time here we've been going on for too long you want to <laughs> come back soon i'm going to come back soon please yeah um i don't want to say it on camera in case we forget but i'll keep it in the notes i want us to talk about blackness mm. because i know today i wanted to ask you what it means to be black and if you identify so mm. i'm not going to ask you that sure um we're going to speak about uh tenders and money and flesh mm. we're going to speak about the the relationship we'll call it the majority of the middle class and poor across the world have mm. the relationship they have with money um yeah yeah for yeah, sure sorry um I'll, I'll try and remember that for the next conversation. Let's do it. Don't worry. I disrupted you on mm, my question mm. on other rites of passage. Mm. You were speaking oh, about yeah, how yeah. you were exposed to what, what, and I want us to end with um, your marriage. Mm. Um, mm. If it's a trauma reaction with your parents, and also um, mm. I believe you're married to a Muslim lady. Mm. So I just want to hear if you're Muslim, if she had to convert or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Me, but rites of passage. Mm. Yeah, well, I guess that's that's another interesting one. Um, mm. So I'm married to a Muslim. I am Muslim. No, no, no. Rites okay. of passage. Sorry. Well, you, outside of entity. Yeah. Um, going to Waluga. Mm. And Waluga, yeah. And going to Oxford. Have you had any other rites of passage where you feel, you know, I had a tough year where some people have depression. Some people make a lot of money. There was a year when I was super famous and I didn't know what. Have you had? You know what? And how has that affected you? How have you remained sane? Mm. Through these, you know, it's been surprisingly tough mental health wise mm. is becoming more famous again. Mm. Like, so there was a time in entity, even though it was a really long time ago yeah. <clears throat> where we were quite famous. Yeah. Um, and then I went away, did my own reflection in Kukwala and like that all went away mm. and I went to UCT and I studied and I just kept my head down mm. and now with the YouTube channel, with the books, um, on social media, I can feel like, and, and people don't understand the reach of YouTube in South Africa right now. Yeah. Um, I, I was, uh, I spoke to JJ Dabane the other day. Yes. 
This is someone who's been on TV and radio for so long. And he was saying, the only time people stop me in the street is they saw me on DJ I saw you on YouTube. Yeah, I saw you on YouTube. Yeah. And I, I can't get over it. Like my channel isn't like as huge as some other channels. I, mm-hmm. I literally, wherever I go now, someone will stop me and say, aye, aye, or I saw this interview or I saw that, right? And I'm sure you get the same thing. It's not necessarily like mega fame, yeah. but but people know who you are. It's nano. Micro. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. When I hear people mm. say stuff like this or when I meet people in the streets, mm. I'm always re-inspired and reminded of, I would like to be part of the fight to get as much free Wi-Fi as possible mm. to the country. Mm. Mm. Not to dismantle mainstream media, not necessarily for alternative voices, even though that's important. Yeah but because of access to information mm. and mm. education that is isolated for the privileged, that if yep. you decolonize, if you level the playing field in terms of access to information by giving everyone access to free internet, mm. this country, technology, business, creating stuff, making movies, becoming academic, whatever, building our own Oxford, etc., yeah. it will come just from that. No, and we're doing a huge disservice by not giving people access to mm, that. Mm, mm. Uh, it'll obviously make us more famous, but um, hey, it'll just um, help the country become better. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with you. So I yeah, agree no. with you. And, and the internet is a game changer. But what, what we do need to actually talk about mm. is, and then so this book <clears throat> that I published was one of the best-selling books mm. in the country, right? At the same time, Although my is father- Is this a new topic? You're talking no, about no, refinding this fame? Is, this is rites of passage. Okay. Rites of passage. So at the same time, my father's always represented a wide variety of famous and sometimes controversial clients, right? Mm. But when he started representing former President Zuma, like it was just a different, different thing altogether. Mm. Um, so all of those things combined were quite difficult to deal with, right? Because like people are now seeing me through my father who's representing Zuma, who's on in the headlines like every week and, and people really detest him yes. for, for doing that, right? Yeah. Like they, they, they hate, they absolutely hate him for representing, representing uh, Zuma, right? So everyone who hates Zuma now hates my father. Yeah. And therefore everyone who hates my father also hates me. Yeah. Because there's somehow a straight line between Zuma, my father and me. Baba ga tutuzan. Right? Baba ga Yeah. Baba ga sees. Mm, mm. Mm. So my father is more famous than he's ever been and he's been famous for like 30 years, yeah. right? Um and more notorious as well. And I'm more famous than I've ever been. Mm. And so this thing that happens when you start becoming more and more well known is that this idea of you that has nothing to do with you gets built up in people's minds, right? And they start attacking that idea of you. Mm-hmm. And I felt that. Like I felt I felt the love mm-hmm. grow and I felt the hate grow. Yeah. And I know that actually both are not exactly connected to who I am. Um becomes dangerous. It's tough. It's really tough. No, but it becomes dangerous. Yeah, yeah, it does. I it mean, does. I became a member of Afri Forum, and I never really th- thought it was mm. a big deal. Hundred rand a month yeah, for yeah. them to close potholes and mm. represent people that feel like they need to be represented. And the idea that when you get some of the hate comments, mm. that there might be a black radical somewhere who might feel I'm an Askari and a sellout, and I need to be put down. Mm. And you're like, no, that's crazy. Yeah. It yeah. gets dangerous. L- listen, like, I hear you. I hear you on that. And people maybe don't talk about it enough. Like in this crazy social media era that we're in, mm. y- you can't shut it all off. It's impossible to mute and block everyone. Yeah. And you get these constant messages, you know. Um, I mean, my dad doesn't talk about the death threats he gets all the time because he's representing someone that people don't like. He doesn't talk about the stuff he knows that happens with his his phone. He doesn't want to talk about it because he doesn't want to, you know, play the victim. Um, 
but I, I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to talk about the, the violence that gets pushed on me. Mm, Cause you're catching stray bullets. I'm catching strays every day. Um, and, and people, you know, smart intellectual people, they know how to convert their strays into what sounds like mm. intellectual discourse, mm. but they're strays and it's unfair. Mm. Um, so that's been tough. And I, I think last year I was really grappling with, with that, like, how do you deal with the image of you that is in other people's minds mm. that takes on a life and a momentum of its own that you can't control? Yeah. Um, and there were some tough times. There have been some tough times. Um, is it better now? It is because I first had to realize, hold on, this actually is affecting me. Mm. Like I think as men, as black men, often we, the, the first thing is admitting something is actually hurting you, right? Yes. You, you're told you, you shouldn't feel any pain whatsoever. Yes. Like just be this unfeeling, unflinching person, right? Yes. So when you finally admit, actually, this is tough, mm. um, you think that you're losing some battle, mm. um, but that's ridiculous. Mm. Like we are human beings and we have feelings, of right? And so I think that moment was really important in speaking to the people around me to say, you know what, this, this climate is, is actually quite difficult. Like, what do I do, you know? Um, and how do I think through this? Already that admission and then, you know, was, was, was key for me and it took a really long time to just come to that point um, of saying, this is, this is hard. Like, I don't know what to do. I've never been here. I can't control this. Mm. Um, so that was important. And then just doing mental health work, um, doing uh, internal reflection work mm. to try and put these things in perspective, mm. um, I think has helped me get out of that difficult low. I hope we'll speak about that as well when mm. we sit down, mm. whether it's the next time or the third time or the whatever. Yeah, for sure. The oh, I'm, the I'm being invited a third time as well. Oh, wow, I'm very if good. I still like you. <laughs> if your dad gives me that 50 No, no, I'm, I'm I, yeah, yeah, okay. No, I'll, I'll let you know the fee. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'd love um, to. I'd love the to. potential, slightly controversial, the potential mental fragility of private school kids. Mm. When you look at some of the more popular people that have taken their lives, WHP being from mm. St. Albans, mm. Ricky Rick being from Hilton, when you read the reports of the number of children that are committing suicide in Silicon Valley, mm. whose parents are millionaires in dollars, you know, and what we're kind of missing there. You know, I remember speaking to my mom recently about, it seems like first world problems are heavier than third world problems. Mm. Not having a meal, not knowing where to sleep, if you've tasted poverty, seems like it's chilled. But it seems the identity, masculinity, um, existential, exist, existentialism, mm. um, I don't really know who I am, I don't really know, it seems like those things seem to weigh so much more, like things like fame. Yeah. For such, like you're famous and you're rich, yeah. like, but you don't understand the noise I have to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the paranoia and mm. the... I, had, I sat down with a mate of mine and he was speaking about, he comes from privilege. Mm. Uh, his father also pulled himself up, built a great business. He went to St. Stithians um, and he was speaking about his insecurities because he felt like with women, all they saw him as was money. And he started seeing himself as, but if I don't have money, what else do I have? And he had to go to therapy just to be like, who am I? And mm. do I have anything outside of money? And you're like, those are fucking first world problems, yeah. though. Why the fuck? And you're like, but they're real to me. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I have food for the whole year. Yes, I drive a nice car, but these are the things that are plaguing me. And those are the mm. things that are plaguing the youth today, some of them. Mm, mm. It's, yes, our struggle may not be basic Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the bottom. They may be psychological. They may be identity. People are committing suicide over... Do I, am I, do I really feel like a man? Um, am I black enough? I'm being bullied because I'm a coconut, you know, mm. kind of. So mm, mm, mm. I, I hope we'll speak about that next time. Um, for sure. Your marriage, you've been married for a long time for a young gent. Yeah. You got married at 23. Yeah. Just, just bow down out of the game. Like <laughs> deuces, I'm out. A founder. I've been out, Cinderella. Of, that, out of that business for a long time, bro. Was, was that, do you think that was a trauma reaction? Um, mm. 
a lot of our fathers didn't have present fathers mm. who told them I love you, yeah. who listened to their kids. Yeah, sure. So they overdo that, some of them. Mm. Mm. A lot of us are raised in single mothers, single parent households. And as a trauma reaction, we rush into mm. marriage to be like, my kids have to. Yeah. Regardless, even if we're scratching each other's eyeballs out, do you, yeah. do you think yeah. marriage for you was a trauma reaction? Uh, one. And number two, since you're married to a, a Muslim lady, yeah. what are the dynamics around that? Yeah, sure. I don't think so. You know, um, I don't want to impose some ideal of monogamy and long marriage on everyone. Like, because that, that leads to trouble, yeah. you know, and I don't believe that's the only way people can express their love for each other. I came exactly from a, where there's different fathers and different mothers and all of that, right? I'm a lecturer, I'm a student. I'm a gang, I'm a season. out of order. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, no, no. And so, but I'm saying it's one way. Yeah. And it's maybe a rare way. Um, Monogamy. But, yeah, yeah. And, and marriage, even marriage. It's, be, um, it's becoming rare. I think so. I think so in our generation. Um, okay. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but it, was, it wasn't a trauma reaction. It was, it was the opposite. It was a love reaction, actually. Yeah. Um, like, I fell in love with this woman, bro. Like, very hard. Have such, you ever loved such, someone? Such a bitch, nigga. Such a you're <laughs> so soft. You see now. You need to do some push-ups. Look at all some of this. Way. Look at the toxic masculinity just spewing, man. Just do some push-ups, you know. <laughs> spew with the boys. Drink some beer. No, I'm <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Felt so, deeply in love. Yeah. Like, have you ever loved? Where did you meet her? At UCT. Okay. Have you ever loved someone when they come into a room and a tear comes to your eye and you don't know what the hell so just gay. happened to you? That is so gay. You know, I, I have a fear, by the way, of that mm. because I have experienced it mm. and because it's ended badly. Mm. And the fear of someone holding so much power over you. Mm. Mm. Um, I, I don't think I'm a toxic male. I've had to work on different spectrums of finding my masculinity. I fear giving a strange woman that amount of power over my happiness, my sense of being, my purpose, where I make up life decisions around her. Mm. I am scared of that. Look, I think there are different, there are different eras of love, right? Mm. Um, there's, there's, there's that moment like of infatuation when you first meet someone and a tear comes to your eye when they walk and you're like, what the hell just happened to me, right? Yeah. But there's no way that survives like 11 years in. Sure. But there's certain aspects of love that you only and and by the way, I'm I'm not saying if there's a toxic person or if, if they're abusing you or or if there's abuse in their relationship. But if if you have a genuine level of respect and love, there are certain things that only get unlocked three years into the show sure. or five years in or I'm ten years super in. Super right? love, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's this weird thing where you start knowing your partner for longer than you've known like so many other people in your life and then sure. suddenly they become more similar in a way to family in some ways than like a friend that you happen to have an intimate relationship with yeah. so they they're different stages you know mm. um but i just the way it happened was i fell in love with this person mm. and i was willing to commit to them at that point um and the Islam thing. So Sumeya was a Muslim woman at that time. She wore a hijab. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I, I don't know how, how, how I don't want to go into like deep private conversations about how I expressed my feelings. Okay. But if, effectively, um, she was like, yeah, I feel the same way, but like, I need you to explore Islam, because that's like a, a boundary for me, mm. right? Now, to add more complication to my family, there's also many religions. Right? Mm. So there's a long strand of Islam in my family. My yeah. brother, my older brother is Muslim and has been for a long time. I've got family in the Middle East that are Muslim. So I've always known Islam in my family. Yeah. They're atheists in my family. There are Christians. Um, but I had never like explored Islam as a religion. Um, so 
I said, look, I'm not going to jump into anything, but I'm I'm going to explore. I'm going to read. Mm. Um, and I eventually, what they say, embraced Islam. Mm. But what I also want to say is like, I don't, because I come from such a diverse religious background, I don't believe that there is this one path to spiritual enlightenment or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, I ultimately believe there are many paths. Um, Islam is one of them, mm. the one that I'm on, but Christianity in its best form is another. Mm. Hinduism in its best form is, an, is another. Judaism in its best form is another. Forms of African spirituality in their best form are another. There are even interesting forms of atheism which are you know, interesting and intellectually defensible, which mm. grapple with, which, you know, by all means, um, ultimately find a way to tap into your higher self. Like how do you become a better person, not just in terms of achieving things in the world, but achieving truth. Um, that's what, what it means to me. And, are you, are you, you Muslim? Know, yeah. Yeah. Since when? Since 13 years ago. Before you guys officially got married? Yeah. Yeah. And you started this journey for her? Yeah. Would yeah. that be a form of probably one of the greatest gifts that you've given to your wife? Probably. Um, I ask this because I don't think we demand much of each other in relationships anymore. Mm. Mm. There used to be a sense of responsibility. Today, women generally want you to have money, send them e-wallets and stuff. And I wonder if each of us are meant to demand something greater than, mm. which actually, a child is meant to be that, but uh, we've kind of messed with that as well. But being like, if you want us to commit, you have to go through a rite of passage. Mm. Look, ultimately, every spiritual journey goes through people, mm. right? Um, either your parents uh, brought you into a religion and at some point you have to decide whether you want to stay in that religion, but people close to you bring you to a spiritual path or it's a friend you know. That is true. Um, or it's a sibling or it's the person you love. Mm. So there's really nothing special, actually. It's just a close person to me okay. who I love said, look at this path. And I was like, okay, let me have a look. Yeah. And I was like, oh, whoa. Like the Quran is like a very interesting text, mm. you know. Um, the life of the prophet Muhammad mm. is just a fascinating life, just like the life of Jesus is a really fascinating life. Just like the lives of like ancient yogis in India is fascinating. They all came to similar appreciations about yeah. spiritual truths. Um, and... Yeah. So, so in some ways it was a gift to her, but in some ways she gave a gift to me. That's dope. My uh, firstborn son, Nkunz Malang, and his youngest sister, Africa, mm. their maternal uncle converted to Islam. Interesting. Which I think is pretty dope. Uh, and mm. I was telling him that my maternal grandfather mm. was an Indian Muslim man, mm. uh, Chata wow. Hussein Amin. So my mom is half Indian uh, Muslim and half Black African. Interesting. Yeah. Like I said, mixed race boy. We're coming to mixed colonize the world. They don't know what's coming. We've already colonized YouTube. The Jeez, they the don't world. know what's coming. Huh. Okay. So I've got some material for my interview with you. Caesar, thank you so much for coming through, bro. Um, we still have to discuss so much. I thought we were going to yeah. speak about politics. We didn't get to <laughs> that. Ah, so you owe stuff. me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you owe me. So thank you so much for coming through. No, I really appreciate it. Once again, big ups for what you're doing. Yeah. I see the work and uh, thank you for the conversation. Are you here to promote your book? Huh, what? This? This whole thing. Oh, is this my book? Whoa. <laughs> the new apartheid. The, the best guy. the best selling book available uh, in all bookstores. This guy. No, this this is actually for you, bro. Thank you so uh, much. Yeah. So hope you really find appreciate it. food for thought. Before we shut it down, I don't know if you guys can see. Which camera? I would be Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> The New Apartheid, Sizu and Pofu Walsh, Oakley Smith, and, and other, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> really looking forward. Apartheid did not die. It was privatized. Tempe uh, Gangnugai Tobi, who's an amazing advocate as yeah, well, yeah. explodes the myth that apartheid is a thing of the past, a hugely important book. Really looking forward to reading this. Thank you so much. Thank you, my bro. Sizu, I look forward to seeing you again. Pretty dope. Thank you. Thanks, man.